Okay. Uh, right there. there We're alive. <laughs> <laughs> hey, kids. How are you doing today? So this is um, this is going to be, a, and I won't I won't do a formal introduction yet because we're a little early and we want to wait for people to come in. But um, this is going to be the place to ask your your travel questions, and um, could be travel an hour by car and how to pack and what to take, or it could be a trip around the world when uh, when you get vaccinated and. And people are traveling again. So I know a lot of people are planning travel. So um, we're going to talk about travel today. And so we'll we'll try to we'll try to keep your questions to um, travel related, packing related, if you can, if you can stand it. No fly time questions today. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, David Shirley. How you doing? Hi, Scott. David, I hope you and Judy are doing well. Bill from Indiana is here. Diego from Buenos Aires. Scott from California. And that's it. We're, we're only going to have six people today, so that's it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so anyway, let's start. So I'll, I'll introduce you, Seth. Today, we're, we're very lucky to have uh, Seth Berger, who is a uh, travel expert um, in Orvis Travel. Seth is the person, um, if you want to take a trip and you're not quite sure where to go and you want some advice on uh, on where to go and, and how to go about it, uh, Seth is your man. Uh, for, for most of you know this, but just in case you don't know, Orvis has a full service um, travel department for fly fishing and wing shooting travel. And uh, so if you're taking a, a sporting vacation, you know, a lot of times questions come up like, uh, is this a good place for my family? And, you know, um, I have a non-angler going with me. Would this be a good fit? Um, but, you know, uh, timing, seasons. Seth, what other questions do you get um, in um, the travel department? Yeah, timing and seasons are probably the most common. Um, a lot of people... They might be traveling somewhere already, and so they call us up to see if we have guides or lodges in the area. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And then also, um, you know, species-specific stuff. Um, people will call us because they're interested in chasing bonefish or permit or tarpon or specific trout. Um, mm -hmm. So they want to go to to certain places for that. Mm -hmm. And unlike um, unlike in 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 past years years going by orvis travel can advise people on domestic uh fishing opportunities as well or it used to be just just an international um travel department but now um, now we can help you pick the right orvis endorsed guide and lodge and outfitter and so on that's right yeah so we're doing a lot of stuff with our domestic partners now um from maine to alaska so um, a lot of great mm -hmm. options out there for people who still want to travel and uh don't feel comfortable want leaving the country or um, for whatever reason, want to stay closer to home. So um, we still have some great availability in Maine for this spring, chasing brook trout and landlocked salmon, um, which if you haven't done landlocks are a ton of fun. Um, I know you like them. Yeah. <laughs> I love them. Yeah. I love them. Yeah. And other, other great opportunities out there. So um, spaces uh -huh. are filling up, but um, there's still some good options. And we're doing a lot more hosted trips with, uh, with Orvis hosts, right? That's right. Yeah. So um, some of us from the travel department will host a, a couple of trips a year each. Um, and then we rely on some of our endorsed partners from around the world to host trips as well. So um, you might be down in Argentina um, fishing at a lodge down there. And um, I know Kip Veith, one of our endorsed guides from the Midwest, um, he's hosting a trip down there next year. So um, you get some knowledge from um, guides that maybe have an expertise in a different area, which um, a lot of times can be really helpful when you're fishing in a new destination um, yeah. to get some tips and tricks and, and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Great. Very cool. All right. Let's see if we have any questions. Dustin has his pack out. He says, let's pack. Okay. <laughs> oh, I see one here. We got one from Ryan who asked about uh, carry-on. Yeah, um, which is a, a really good place to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Um, so I know you and I were talking about this yesterday and um, mm -hmm. we have, uh, you know, it's always important to check on what the regulations are for the country you're traveling to if you're traveling internationally. So, um, you know, whether TSA allows you to carry something on in the States or not, um, it's important to know where you're going. Um, for example, if you if you fly down to Argentina, you're not allowed to carry reels on with lines spooled on them. So you have to separate mm -hmm. those if you're going to carry it on um, for whatever reason. But if you're if you're traveling domestically, TSA does allow you to carry on fly rods, um, and whether you have them in a tube and it can be even a two piece rod, which is you know usually a bit bigger than your four piece. Um, you can carry a two piece onto a plane um, if it's in a tube or we have these uh, carry all bags. I think we call it a, a carry it all. Here's here's one there. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the things that I keep in mind. Um, but you can actually carry this onto a plane, even though it is bigger than your regular carry on. Um, and it looks like Ryan asked specifically about forceps and nippers. Um, forceps, there is a maximum size that's allowed as a carry on. Um, I believe it's right around seven inches. So um, I know our new our new um, pliers um, are TSA safe or at least they were when they came out. So it's, there's always a chance the regulations change. So make sure you check those. Um, but regular forceps and nippers, even hooks are, are good to carry on a plane. Um, you shouldn't have any problem with that. Um, at the end of the day, it is up to the TSA agent whether they're gonna allow you to carry it on or not. So just be respectful. And um, if they tell you, you can't bring your oversized luggage on and let them know it is fishing equipment um, and that you believe you are allowed to carry it on and, and chances are they'll let you bring it through. But um, ultimately it is their decision. And one thing people, not many people are going to travel like this, but I was traveling once with a fly tying vice mm -hmm. and the, a fly tying in my carry on, a fly tying vice is technically a tool over seven inches long. And, uh, I, I had to sweet, I, I almost got it taken away. I had to sweet talk my way through it, but you know, yeah. so, uh, so be careful of any tools that are longer than, I think it's seven, but uh, again, you should check before you fly because they could change. They could change that that length. Yep. And you were telling me yesterday when we were talking that the, that um, fly rods are an exception, like uh, like a guitar or something like that. That you can carry on a fly rod even though it's over length. Exactly. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so because they're fragile, um, and like you said, much like a guitar, um, you are able to carry them on. Um, even mm -hmm. if they are an oversized um, container, if you will. So mm -hmm. whether it be a, a rod tube or in a, one of our carry it all bags, um, you are able to bring them on. Um, and what I like to do when I carry it on, especially if it's just a rod tube, um, is I like to give it to the flight attendant as you board the plane and ask them to put it in the coat closet. And that way you don't forget it in the overhead compartment um, and, uh, and they'll have it for you as you are uh, getting off of the plane. Um, Sometimes they don't have a coat closet or they don't have space. So just remember to check those overhead bins, um, especially if you're just carrying a rod tube, they do tend to roll to the back. Um, but if you strap it to a backpack and put it up there, that usually works pretty well. Now, some, something I thought about today, I meant to ask you, the carry it all, the carry, carry, carry it all, right? That yeah. you just held up. I, I fly with those all the time and I check them because I, I've never had a rod broken. I don't use rod tubes. I just, I put the rods in there. They're totally secure. Reels, never had anything damaged. But I was thinking um, you could gate check that too, right? Because I'm not, I'm not worried. Of, I'm not worried about it um, getting anything getting damaged. I'm worried about it not getting there with me. Yeah. So you could gate check that carry it all too, right? Easily. Yeah, absolutely. And, and a lot of times they ask you to because it does take up quite a bit of space in mm -hmm. the overhead compartments. Um, okay. So yeah, any opportunity where I'm one flight away from my destination and they're asking people to gate check stuff, um, I'm usually the first one up there and, and handing it over to them. And um, uh -huh. I've, uh, okay. I've traveled for at least four or five years now with, with our old carry doll. And I'll show that um, when we talk about specific stuff, but um, our new ones are um, a little bit, you know, uh, tougher fabric um, and they've got a great pocket here to put your passport make sure you take that out if you're gate checking it um, <laughs> and, uh, and any other items that you want quick access to and then the the zippers here um, have a, the loops that overlap so that you can uh, put a little lock on it so um, I always keep a TSA lock on mine just in case I'm traveling that way I don't forget it but um, that's a good little feature that we've added to it uh, to make it easier to travel with
Um, here's a question uh, from Roger. Have, have you, here, I'll put it up on the, have you found certain airports or airlines that are more fisherman friendly or conversely uncooperative than others? Um, I haven't ha found any that are uncooperative, um, but mm. it's, it's definitely seems to be the case that if you, you know, fly to the Western U S or um, places like Florida, where there are a lot of anglers traveling, um, those agents are much more uh, aware of fishing rods and stuff going on planes and used to it. So um, in those destinations, um, they're, they're used to it. They see it all the time. So those are kind of the friendliest places, but um, as long as you're, friendly and and not combative if someone tells you that you can't bring your fishing rod on um usually you get away with it i've i've flown through new york city and been told that i can't bring it on and i've politely told the tsa agent that it's a fishing rod and it is part of the tsa exemption as to carry-ons and they say okay go ahead well here's a good here's a really good tip from david it says i i always print out the regs on the tsa site and carry them with me Sometimes the agents don't even know the rules. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's, what a, that's a, a great one. tip. I'm I'm going to do that one myself next time. Yeah. Um, Zach is curious about fly tying gear for traveling. Mm -hmm. um, Zach, there I don't know I don't even know if we sell it anymore. We used to sell a fly tires travel carry kit. I'm not sure if we do anymore, but um, I use. I use one of those. It's a little nylon bag, and you can organize mm -hmm. your stuff and put put it in there. Um, you have to be careful. I guess scissors. Um, yep. Scissors would be tough to carry on, right? Yeah, scissors. You, sharp. You're probably going to have some trouble with. Um, yeah, but really, I mean, really fly tying gear, you could probably just gate gate check it, or or oh, not not gate check it, but you'd have to mm -hmm. check it in your in your other bag. Yep. And uh, if you're traveling internationally with fly tying stuff, uh, be very careful with uh, very material. Um, they may confiscate them from you at the airport. So right. um, if you're traveling particularly South America, particularly Chile, because they're so protective yep. of their agriculture in Chile. Mm -hmm. um, I almost got all my flies taken away from me um, once. Uh, yep. So uh, be very careful about uh I know Chile in particular, and probably Argentina. Mm -hmm. yep. um, Zach, I, I've also been known to just throw a bunch of stuff in Ziploc bags and put it in my duffel bag. <laughs> <laughs> Be really careful about glues and head cements, though, because the change in pressure can then open those bottles up, and you're probably better off not taking any anything with uh, liquid or solvents mm -hmm. uh, with you. Just do without do without the head cement if you're gonna be a traveling fly tire or put it in a separate Ziploc so that if it opens up somehow, it doesn't get all over everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's all good stuff. Tim wants to know about a minimalist approach to packing. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, one thing I do, um, particularly if I'm just traveling on my own and maybe it's not a fishing trip, um, but I do, you know, every, if you bring a rod, every fish can be, every trip can be a fishing trip, um, is I'll take a, a larger, um, tube for a rod, um, and put two rods in it so that I only have to carry one tube. And I found if you put them opposite directions, um, a lot of times they'll fit. So I might take a, a tube for a nine weight and put a, a four and a five weight in there. Um, if I'm going to do a little bit of trout fishing. Um, and then you just strap that to your backpack and bring a couple fly boxes and a reel or two, and um, you should be good to go. Um, so I found that to be a, a pretty good way to travel lightly. Yeah. Tim, it's really, you know, it's really a matter of common sense. You, you think of where you're going to go and you think of what you're absolutely going to need and throw everything else, leave everything else home on the table. <laughs> and then of course the, the thing that you leave home on the table, you you'll be kicking yourself that you don't have, but um, you know, if you gotta if you gotta minimize, um just take what's essential. That's pretty much it. Um, the I one thing I oh sorry, oh, go ahead. No, I was just no, gonna say I saw a question come in about disinfecting gear. Um mm -hmm. specific to one country, but there are others out there that have required you in the past to, or still do require you to um, disinfect your gear before you arrive to make sure that there are no invasive species hitching a ride with you um, from the States. And um, it's a great thing to, cleaning your gear is a great thing to do 
regardless if you're traveling internationally, you know, if you're going from one state or even one watershed to the next, you should make sure your gear is clean. But um, a lot of times, um, as long as your gear is dry and, and looks very clean, um, you should be safe there. Um, one thing is, you know, rinse your gear in, in some, a little bit of soap solution, let it dry. And um, with boots, if you, you know, pick out all the rocks and, and scrub the bottom of them with a, an old toothbrush, that usually does the trick. So do you not need to have the, the disinfection that they used to when you go to Iceland? I remember you used um, to have to go to a vet and get it yeah. disinfected. Yeah, so both Iceland and New Zealand used to require certification that it has been cleaned. Um, you no longer have to do that. Um, mm -hmm. I traveled to, to both countries rather recently, and um, both cases I did just what I described, you know, clean your gear, let it dry, and, and make sure your boots have a good, you know, clean sole that looks clean. Um, and, okay. Um, yeah, as long as that's the case, you should be good to go. Um, and in both cases, if you were to show up in either country and your gear was dirty, um, they'll disinfect it there on site. There might be a charge, um, but they're not going to confiscate your boots from you. Um, uh -huh. okay. you know, and also to know that, um, you know, Iceland or sorry, New Zealand uh, does not allow felt sold waiter or what waiting boots. Um, and that may be the case in other countries as well. So that's one thing to note when you're packing for a trip. Uh, make sure you know what the local regulations are. Right. And dry fly fisher 11, um, as long as your Orvis rod is, uh, as long as you're the original owner of your Orvis rod and it is within 25 years, it doesn't matter how it breaks. We will, we will <laughs> replace it for you. So it doesn't matter. There's nothing that's outside the warranty. You can, you get a TSA agent could break it over over his knee and and uh, you you could still get it get it uh, repaired or replaced all right seth why don't you show us let's talk about let's 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 take a peek into your um into your carry it all and oh, show sure. us show us what you put in there yeah so this is um the larger of the two that we sell i think we call it a large um and i just keep this full pretty much all the time and in the back of my car. Um, and so you can see, I got some reels in the top there. Um, the one compartment you can't see has extra sunglasses in there just below the reels. Um, and then I keep my can you jacket. Bring it a little? Can you bring a little closer to the camera? Maybe hold it yeah. side, uh, sideways. Yeah. I hope, yeah. I hope all this doesn't fall out. Um, <laughs> some entertaining stuff. So, um, yeah, you can see, I got some extra reels there in the top, um, below that are some sunglasses. And then right here, I've got some tippet, uh, extra float and some studs to put in my boots if I need to. Um, and then I got my wading jacket here with some extra layers packed underneath that um, in case I go for a swim. Um, and then in the bottom there, there's all kinds of extra stuff. Um, let's see, I got a headlamp, some extra laces for my boots, um, an extra fly line, some sun gloves, and a buff. Um, so just all kinds of stuff that would be good to have. Um, especially a headlamp, um, you know, you go out fishing in the afternoon and the fishing's good and, uh, you might be walking back to the car in the dark. So I try and keep one in my pack, but I have an extra one here in uh, my carry at all, just in case. Um, and then on the other side, we've got these good zippered compartments. I always have a handful of extra leaders, um, some extra zingers cause they do break. Um, and you'll see a couple of Sharpies in there too. Um, you know, I like to carry those in my pack, um, while I'm out fishing, um, Sometimes you can't quite see a post on a parachute atoms and it helps if you color it with a fluorescent Sharpie. Um, so that's just a good little thing to have handy. Um, and then some extra indicators in the bottom there. So that's kind of the main compartment here. Um, and then all my fly boxes and stuff are in my pack because I was out fishing yesterday, but um, there's plenty of space in here to fit that stuff when you're traveling. Um, and then in the top compartment here is where you keep all the rods. Um, and so you can see there, I've got five rods in here. Um, the longest one is in a, a four piece, uh, an 11 foot four piece rod. Um, so that fits in the larger one just fine. Um, and without the tubes, you could fit, I think I've taken eight rods on a trip um, without any trouble. And um, the tops of these are pretty sturdy. Um, so I don't really worry about them um, getting damaged, especially if I'm carrying it on. Um, so you can really load that up with, with all your rods when I'm, fishing in the summer, I've got everything in there. So whether I'm going brook trout fishing in Vermont or the next day, I might be heading down to the, 
you know, Cape Cod and going striper fishing. I have everything I need in here. I've, um, I've checked rods in one of those bags for years since we first started selling them and I've never had a rod damaged ever. Yeah, they're great. And, um, you know, if you are worried about it, um, you can layer underneath it with some clothing, um, to add a little bit of extra padding. Um, yeah. but yeah, I'm, I'm not worried about it either. No, once once they're in their cloth sack and they're, and they're mm -hmm. you know in four pieces, it's it's pretty difficult to break them. Yep. Even for a baggage handler. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's just kind of all the stuff that I carry there. Um, and then as far as waders and boots go, um, I try and keep the back of my car pretty organized um, so I can always find stuff. Especially, I do often put fly boxes in my waders and I get back to the car and I'll just put those in the trunk. Um, if I don't stick them in my carry at all or back in my pack. Um, so having your waders and boots tucked away does help quite a bit. Um, and so I keep mine, um, in this little mud room kind of case that we have. Um, and so it's a nice place to stand on. It unfolds kind of all the way out here. Um, and so it's something to stand on when you're putting your waders on. And then it's got this great little zippered compartment here to, to zip them away in. Um, and fold it up so that they do stay organized and there's a good little handle for carrying them inside to hang them up as well. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of this. We just, I think we just came out with it and I'd never really used something like it before, but it's, uh, it's working pretty well. Yeah. I don't put waiters in mine cause my waiters stay in my truck all the time, but, <laughs> um, but I do, I do love it for, um, extra clothing. Mm -hmm. I just put all my extra clothing, all my warm clothing, um, in there. And then, and then I, I got a tip over the winter, uh, which was a great tip. Uh, when winter fishing, when you drive to the river, um, you wear one pair of socks. And when you get there to fish, you, you change your socks so that yep. you're starting with a nice dry pair of socks. I got that from Rachel Lineweber. And so I carry the extra socks in there and, um, and I change when I get in my, uh, underwater pants, I change when I get to the river, I, I got something to stand on. My feet don't get wet. And uh, yeah, it works great for spare clothes. Yeah, the, the changing socks is definitely a, a great tip. I learned that skiing and it definitely mm -hmm. goes over to fishing, especially in these early months of the season. Uh, there's nothing worse than having cold feet. Um, Rob is asking, have you ever shipped rods to your destination in the carryall? Um, I haven't. But I don't see why you couldn't, um, as long as you had a box to to fit it in and pack it up. Um, just let them know that it's coming, and uh, as long as the place that you're going is you know ready to receive it, they should be good to go. Oh, here's a good one. Um, any secret to packing for air travel? Waiters and boots that are still damp. You know, if at the at the end of a trip you're yeah. going home. And yeah, that's a good one. Um, I always pack a, a uh, trash bag. Oh, um, <laughs> always, always bring an empty trash bag when I'm going on yeah. a trip. Um, yeah. And that way you can put your waders and boots and any dirty clothes that might already be wet. Um, you can pack them in that and, and separate it out from any souvenirs you might have or, or dry clothes that you might need later in the trip. So yeah. Yeah. Always that's what I do. Too. <laughs> trash bags are, trash bags are very handy. Mike says that Argentinian baggage handlers can break the zippers on the old carry and all, but the rods were all fine. <laughs> That's okay. <good> to hear. <laughs> zippers can be fixed. Let's see. Do we have any other questions? Oh, Michael says he packs multiple rods in the rod socks, then rolls them up in his waiting jacket and then into the carry at all. Yeah, that's nice. it. That's a great idea. Or the pro hoodie, which is nice and padded. You know, yeah. the pro hoodie is a good, is a good, you never know when it's get cold. Even if you go to or the Rockies in the summertime, you never know when you might want that pro hoodie. Yeah. Yeah. It's always a, a good thing to bring some extra layers, especially something like that, um, regardless yeah. of where you're going. And even down to the tropics, um, a lot of people don't think about it, but I think the coldest I've ever been on the fishing boat was, um, after a brief rainstorm down in Belize and we were running from one flat to the next and um, I didn't bring a fleece and I mean who packs a fleece to go to Belize but yeah um, when yeah. it's you know 60 instead of 85 and you're wet it makes a big difference yeah it's cold it can be cold um 
Why don't you, why don't we show people the new carry at all and just show them the improvements? Sure. Um, yeah. So overall it's, it's generally the same, same shape. Um, it's got a handle here as the old one did. Um, but we've added a handle up on the top, which I really like, especially for traveling through the airport. Um, I tend to stand it on its side and, um, being able to pick it up like that is, is nice. Um, and in the summer I have like a false floor in my car, just a piece of plywood and a couple of two by fours. And I leave mine open and in, in there. So this will make for a good handle, um, for pulling it out, um, kind of like a drawer. And then, um, also on the outside, we've added a, um, an external pocket here, um, with a zipper that you could put, um, your passport, or if you print out those TSA regulations, you'd keep those right in here. Um, just yeah. remember to take out those important documents if uh, if you do check it or gate check it. Um, so I might be careful about what I put in there. Um, yeah. And then uh, on the external zipper as well, I don't know if you can see it on there, but we've added um, two little overlapping holes um, so you can put a, a lock on there. Um, the old one didn't have that. So that's a nice improvement there. Or somebody um, suggested a zip tie too, yep. just, just to keep them from, from uh, opening up. Yeah, zip tie will work. So if you do if you do put locks on it, make sure that it is those um, TSA approved locks so they can open it without breaking it. Um, mm -hmm. They'll still find a way to open your lock if it's not a TSA lock, but it'll be the last time you use it. Um, and then uh, the external, also we used a, a Cordura fabric. So it's just a little bit tougher. Um, like I said earlier, I've been using mine for about five years and had no issues with it, but nice little upgrade there on the fabric. Um, and then we'll go to Mr. the inside. Mr. Hutch Hutchinson says, for your information, some places like destinations in Alaska and Colorado recommend shipping your gear ahead of your trip. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Hutch Thanks, would Hutch. know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hutch is, Hutch <laughs> is you, Hutch. one of our uh, travel specialists. So um, if you need help planning a trip, especially to Alaska or Colorado, he's a great guy to talk to. Um, and then uh, the inside of the carry it all, uh, much the same as the old one. Um, it's got those top zipper mesh pockets. Um, and behind that is where you can put your rods. Um, and then the internal part has a whole bunch of different compartments that you can customize. These are all Velcro, so they come out. Um, and they've got a nice little um, improvement to the old ones where the Velcro is just flat on the ends of these pieces. Um, these seem to stick a bit better. So another nice little upgrade there. Um, but overall, it's um, much the same as the old one was, and I think that's a good thing because they work really well. Yeah. Here, here's a good tip for uh, for ultralight setup. Uh, e. Hesse says, my ultralight setup is a Speedo and a Tankara rod. That's <laughs> that's ultralight. Yeah. I, I don't know if I try that in Alaska, but uh, <laughs> no. to each their own. Um, Joe Lynn is asking, I'm fishing in Alaska late winter. In early spring, weather can be snow, rain, sun. I worry most about being cold without packing the kitchen sink. Ideas? Sure. Um, yeah, a really important part of packing, especially for that time of year, is is layers so that if it does get warm, you can take some stuff off. Um, and uh, as far as materials go, I strongly recommend uh, wool or a synthetic wool blend. Um, those will keep you warm even if they do get wet. Um, and of course, a wading jacket is most important, especially in the rain, but um, those wool layers, whether it's um, a base layer for your legs or your, your upper body, um, and then outer layers too, mid layers that are, that are wool and synthetics um, are going to be your best bet. Cotton will keep you warm as long as it's dry, but as soon as it gets wet, um, you could be in big trouble. So, um, and the nice part about wool too, is that um, it's antimicrobial. So you can wear it multiple days and it's not going to smell even if you do sweat in it. Uh, just a question, just a, a, a quick comment for Daniel. Daniel, the encounter rod that you're looking at is the only Orvis rod that does not carry a 25 year guarantee. Every other Orvis rod, no matter where you buy it, as long as it's not a counterfeit Orvis rod, will have a 25 year guarantee, but the encounter rods do not. They're guaranteed against defects, um, you know, again, they're guaranteed to uh, not to break uh, uh, in in a uh, non-catastrophic situation. So they they are guaranteed against defects, but they they don't have the twenty-five year, which is a 
totally um, open ended, doesn't matter how you break it guarantee. So that is that is the exception for the encounter, regardless of where you buy it. Is the carry at all somewhat temperature controlled? Do you worry about keeping tippet and leaders in it? If you keep it in your car, heat uh, dry fly fisherman heat won't won't hurt your tippet material. It's uh, ultraviolet light that'll hurt it. So um, the uh, heat won't hurt fly lines or or tippet material. Fly lines, I think, melt at about four hundred degrees, and if your car gets four hundred degrees, you have other problems. Um, but no, your your tippet um, as long as you keep the the uh, keep them not exposed to the sun, closed up, mm -hmm. uh, you won't hurt your tip of material. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jim is uh, asking about, I get the TSA exception. Thanks for that. What about the fact for airlines, it exceeds the typical size limitation for carry-on. Do most airlines accept the same exception and allow it uh they they do yep um much like if you were carrying a guitar on um even though it's oversized um because it is um fishing rods and, and fragile you are allowed to bring it on of course there could be exceptions you never know right <laughs> That's but crazy. even then you even then they they'd probably gate check it for you so at least mm -hmm. you know that it would get there and it wouldn't, and it wouldn't be subject to quite as much stress um, piled under other stuff as it might be in the, in the cargo bay. Can you show the new waterproof pack, Mike? There is not a new waterproof pack at this time. Right? There's a new pack. There's a new safe passage pack that we're going to show on. Um, we're going to talk about on another. Um, another Facebook live with Jesse Haller, but it's not waterproof. It's water. It's got a water resistant. I've got one here. I can show you. We won't go into detail, but um, I can't show you any better than you're going to see it in the catalog. So anyway, there it is. So it's got a, got a waterproof fabric here, but it's not seam sealed and um, you know, it'll it'll keep some some water out, but this is not a waterproof pack. No. All right, let's see what else we have. Name three backcountry items that are essential but not necessarily obvious. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, one that's probably obvious, but I think a lot of people travel without is a first aid kit. Um, and it doesn't have to be like this big thing that you'd see in an office or anything like that, but, um, some basics and, um, there's all kinds of different options out there, but definitely traveling with a first aid kit is, um, is really important. Um, and then in that first aid kit, or could be a separate item depending on how you're categorizing things, but, um, a way to start a fire, um, if you get stuck out there in the back country and, regardless of what time of year it is, it can get pretty cold at night. So whether it's waterproof matches or a lighter, um, I definitely recommend traveling with that. Um, and uh, some food. I think a lot of people go out fishing and forget to eat during the day. Um, and so making sure you have a couple of cliff bars or, or something like that, um, those can be a big, uh, a big lifesaver um, if you get stuck out there. So those are, those are three things that I always keep, um, also a headlamp, um, kind of anytime I go fishing, I bring a headlamp. A lot of times, even when I'm 10 miles from my house, um, I end up coming out in the dark and you never know when there's a new stick that fell out of a tree that you got to step over. So uh, <laughs> those are, those are the important items that I always bring. With me. Well, I always you know. have a, I always have, a, uh, other than those, I always have a section of duct tape in my, mm. in my either sling bag or air fishing vest or whatever, whatever I'm actually wearing, I always have a one, of, you know, one of those small packs of duct tape. Yeah. Well, one thing I do with that, cause it's great to have duct tape, but it's, you know, who wants to carry a whole roll around, um, is I, I've taken duct tape and taped it onto my water bottle. Um, and so that way you have, you know, maybe a, a six foot section or something like that. Um, but it doesn't <laughs> yeah. take up any additional space and, and it's still going to stick well. Um, 
So yeah, that's a, that's a great one to have. Um, Ed, just uh, another question about heat. There is there is nothing that you can hurt in a hot no fly fishing piece of gear that you can hurt in a hot car. Um, it won't hurt lines, rods, rails, flies. The one thing you have to be careful of is like a gel fly floatant. Um, those can open up and the gel can liquefy and it can get all over and make a mess. <laughs> but, but other than that, there's nothing that you take fly fishing with you um, that will be damaged in a hot car. Unless your car gets up to 400 degrees. And you've got other problems. You're probably not fishing in that area anyway. You're right? probably <laughs> not using that car anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Extra batteries for the headlamp. That's a good mm -hmm. one, Mike. Yep. Yeah, that's something I keep in my carry all. Um, got a couple right here. Um, so, yeah, just a couple of AA, AAA batteries, whatever you need. Um, definitely great to have those. There's been more than once I've gotten to the river and my headlamp's dead. So, you switch those out before you go fishing. Yep. Uh, Chris, unfortunately, although I've tried to stuff them in there, boots, waders, net, and sling pack, uh, unless the sling pack is unloaded, won't fit in your carry at all. Yep. <laughs> I've tried. <laughs> but, there there uh, are some. Maybe nets. this. Um, yeah, I found some of the, the narrower width nets um, will fit mm -hmm. in there. Um, they might push the zipper a little bit, but I know we used to sell one that was um, – it wasn't a wood net, um, but there there are some nets out there that that do fit. So um, okay, and, and you could put stocking ones. foot waders. You could put stocking foot waders in there too. Yeah, but yep. I don't think boots. I don't think wading boots will fit here. I got a pair of wading boots. Let me check. <laughs> I got all kinds of stuff up here today. <laughs> So I got the Pro Boa boots. I got the new carry it all. Mm, nope. Well, maybe for us, Tom. No, but. even no, even <laughs> us. Um, yeah. They would. They just stick up too much, and they and they would stick into the rods. Um, yeah. You could force them in there, but I wouldn't put wading boots in there. Yeah. Stocking foot waders, yes, I wouldn't put. I wouldn't put wading boots. In there. Yeah, and, and one question I get a lot from people is about packing waders and boots and how they're big and cumbersome and um, yeah. can be difficult to pack. But um, yeah. if your if your boots are good and dry before a trip and um, and they're clean, um, I stuff a ton of clothing into my boots to save space. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah. socks, underwear, t-shirts, they all, they all pack down and fit in there. So you, you can pack your boots and, and save a lot of space. And then, um, if you're careful about folding up your waders too, they don't take up all that much space. If you just kind of crinkle them up and stuff them in a bag, they do, but, um, a good fold usually does it. And the, uh, the, uh, the Orvis ultralight wading boots are pretty damn light and compact mm -hmm. too, uh, yep. for travel. I typically say my alcohol is for cleaning scratches. Ha ha ha. <laughs> Says Pat. <laughs> Michael, uh, Michael says I carry a fully assembled rigged nine foot rods along the headliner in my SUV. The tip section bends slightly where it hits the windshield. And I was worried that it might form a slight curve due to the heat and memory. 10 years of doing that, no problems. Yeah, Michael, I've had a, I've had a rod, uh, and a lot of you have heard this before, but I've had a rod sitting outside, um, outside my garage, leaned up against a wall in a pretty severe curve for three, I think it's three seasons now, uh, winter, summer, spring, and fall. It's just sat there. Um, and, it's still straight as an arrow, and it, it hasn't hurt it a bit. The uh, the cork handle's a little bleached, but other than that, um, graphite rods. You know, if you if you don't whack them against a rock or a, or a log, they're 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 pretty damn tough. Are they, oh, this here's a good one from Tim. Are there any fishing locations or resorts suitable for wheelchair access that you know of? 
So. Yeah, there, um, there are. Um, there are a handful out there. Um, so if Tim, if you shoot me an email, I can give you some some info on them. But um, one that'll shock people is um, we have a an outfitter or an expedition in Kamchatka um, that we endorse. Um, and it's a heli fly in to a lodge. Um, and, well, it's not even a lodge. It's um, four standalone A frame cabins, and um, and they float a, a river called the Azernaya, and they've had guests there in a wheelchair. Um, so there are wow, some surprising locations out there. Yeah, yeah, it's great. That's awesome. Yeah, bamboo and fiberglass, Michael. I'm not bamboo for sure. I wouldn't do that. I only go to hurt fiberglass, but I wouldn't do it with a bamboo rod. But <laughs> nobody's gonna leave a bamboo rod outside no. leaning against the <laughs> leaning, <laughs> leaning against the garage anyway. So <laughs> let's see what other questions do we have here? Did I miss any? Uh, Pat's asking best method of, of traveling with gear, check bag versus carry on. Sorry if I already answered. Um, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if we talked about it specifically, but, um, I always like to carry on my gear. Um, that way, you know, you're going to have it when you get there. Um, and even if it's just a little bit of stuff, you know, one rod and an extra layer of clothes, um, if that'll get you out on the water, I think that's a good way to travel. Uh, Tim Swinnerton, who I hope you know, wants <laughs> yep, to I know, uh, boxers or briefs for international travel? <laughs> oh, that's, that, that's going to be up to you, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he wants to know what you're oh, wearing. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I, I take a mix. Yeah. Oh, Roger Bird, squirmy worms in Texas will, will be hurt by the heat. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, I found out that they don't use squirmy worms in texas very often because they will melt in the heat so i missed one sorry about that squirmy worms don't leave them in your car some people say don't take them with you at all but... jim says back to carry on rod bags after dozens of flights i was only forced to gate check once and that was on a small crj connecting flight that's good to hear john wortman likes your stash oh thanks <laughs> How do you store rods when driving between spots? <laughs> not, not on the top of the car. Let, not on that the top one the hard way. Well, unless you have one of those fancy rod vaults or something. Yes, that's true. <laughs> um, Scott, I have a I have an SUV, and I just shove them inside and go. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of people will break them in half. Um, and then put them on the back seat or whatever. Um, a good tip that I that um, that I was reminded of recently is um, when you're uh, putting your waders on, you get your rod out, and you get your rod rigged up. Put it under the windshield wiper uh -huh. in your car. Uh, a lot of people will put the rod on top of the car, and you'd be surprised at how many people have driven away with the rod on top of the car and later found it smashed in the road or gone. <laughs> Um, so, um, just put your rod, just put your rod under your windshield wiper and chances are you won't be driving away with your rod outside. Don't forget to remove the lithium ion batteries from those headlamps. I think if a lithium ion battery is inside a device, it, you can carry it on. I believe. Um, check T. I would check TSA, but I know um, cameras um, and drones and things like that. If the lithium ion battery is actually inside the device, it doesn't need. It it can be. Um, it can be uh, checked or carried on. I can't remember what you can't. What can't you do with lithium ion batteries? It's either you can't check them or you can't carry them on. 
I think it's you can't check them, right? I think you can't check them, yeah. Yeah, you can't check them. You can carry them on loose. Has anyone ever broken more rods than Jeff Grant? I don't know <laughs> Jeff Grant. Do you know him, Seth? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, Robert, I, I don't know. He, he might hold the record. So far this winter, I don't think he's added to that. So that's a, that's a good start to the fishing season. Michael Zellweger says, if you have the rod mounts that go on your car, get the magnetic ones, not the suction cup style. I have stories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. JMO how many it says how many rods do you typically take on a trip that's for you that's for you Seth um well it dep depends on the trip um I'll always take two um because if you break one you don't want your fishing trip to be over um so definitely always take two um and yeah it, it depends on where you're going if you're going um on a trout fishing trip you may only need one or you might want to bring four um depending on the style of fishing that you're going to be doing um, so it's really more destination specific than anything else. And if I'm going saltwater fishing, um, you know, typically you're going a long way. You're probably spending a lot of money on a guide. I will have, uh, I will have backups for my eights and my tens. I'll take two eights, mm -hmm. two tens. Um, and if I'm taking twelves, I'll take two twelves. Because there's a, you know, you break a rod there and you don't have what you want, you're in big trouble. Yep. Sometimes guides have rods, sometimes they don't that you can borrow. Or sometimes another guest has a rod and sometimes they don't. And the or the Orvis travel host always has extra rods, <laughs> right? <laughs> yep. Yep. And uh, and that goes to a question that just came in from Mike uh, about the most number of rods you've taken on a trip. Um, I, think oh. I've, I think in a carry-all, I've taken 10 rods. Um, so I was hosting a trip down in Belize, and we try and bring a bunch of extras for people to, to try out and as backups. So, um, yeah, I fit, fit 10 rods in a carry-all. Nancy Klimko says, do you have any suggestions on determining the selection, how many flies to pack for a trip? Also, what might be the most efficient method of packing flies? Nancy, just pack them in fly boxes. Um, <laughs> You know, just put them in fly boxes. And um, boy, the 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 selection is really going to depend on where you're going, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm a terrible example of packing light in terms of flies, especially when I'm trout fishing. I just yeah. I bring them all, um, and a lot of times yeah. what yeah. I do is I'll pack my carry it all with um, rods, reels, extra stuff, and a bunch of clothes, and then I'll carry on a backpack as well. And I'll put all my flies in the backpack. Um, I'd rather show up to a place personally, especially if I'm DIY fishing. Um, I'd rather show up without my rods than without my flies. Um, so I carry those on. Yeah. So carry it. My backpack usually has um, my camera and all my fly boxes, and, and that usually <laughs> takes up about all the space. Um, so that seems to be the best way to pack them. Flies um, don't. Flies don't weigh much. They don't take up much space. And if you carry a lot of flies, you might um, consider compartment boxes because you can carry a lot more flies in a compartment. You can just stuff them in there. Um, and they may be, you may be hard to get what you want, but at least you'll have them there with you. So, yeah. And, uh, and also if you're going somewhere and fishing with a guide, or even if you're not fishing with a guide, call some guides in the area, see what they recommend. And that may help you eliminate some of the flies that you're, thinking of bringing or you might need to bring more um, michael zellweger wants to know why i had never caught a trout brook trout bigger than 15 inches before i went to labrador michael you <laughs> you haven't lived in our part of the world i <laughs> yeah. think you, i think michael i think you live in new hampshire you should know better um uh but um a 15 inch brook trout uh, around here is almost unheard of in Vermont and where I grew, grew up in upstate New York, um, you know, unless it's a hatchery fish, but, yeah. um, you know, and I've never, I never caught one. I don't think I've caught one bigger than 15 inches in Maine either. I just never, you know, never been there at the right time. So mm -hmm. yeah, 50 years, uh, I had never <laughs> caught a, I had never caught a brook trout bigger than 15 inches. I'm sure of it. Browns and rainbows, cutthroats, different story, yeah. but brook trout, no. 
Uh, let's see. Do you take flies and a carry-on bag? Yes. Uh, um, yes. There, there are some restrictions internationally, um, especially for bigger hooks. So be careful of those if you're traveling outside the U.S. But anywhere in the U.S., you can bring your flies. Looks like uh, looks like Michael might need to take us brook trout fishing. Yeah, I gotta I gotta go over and fish with Michael. <laughs> and I don't fish lakes much. That's that that may be one reason I never caught a big brook trout is I don't I don't fish a lot of lakes. Uh, let's see. Any other questions? Uh, Ricky, fifteen pounds for fly fishing gear is a lot. Mm-hmm. You should you should be in you should be in good shape. <laughs> yeah, probably. You're... You know, if if it's summer, you could probably wade wet. Um, mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, Yellowstone summers are pretty warm, and uh, by wading wet, you're going to save yourself a ton of of weight. So I would consider just a pair of lightweight wading shoes, um, and just Quick dry pants, same pants you'd probably wear around camp. And you should be, you should be able to eliminate, eliminate a lot of weight there. Yeah. I wouldn't take waders on a, on a horseback trip. Yeah. And I would, I would cut out a rod tube as well. Um, you know, if you bring a couple of rods yeah, in, in yeah. the socks and, and, you know, rubber band the two rod socks together, or three, if you're bringing more rods, um, that those rod tubes can weigh a couple of pounds. So that'll save you some space too. You know, we have a joke around the office. Um, hey, you need some rod tubes? <laughs> yep. <laughs> because because we all have a lot of rods. You know, I mean, we we're, we borrow them or we test them or whatever. And um, nobody nobody uses rod tubes ever for anything that I know of. Um, they're nice when you buy a rod and they're nice to store a rod over the winter. But other than that, um, rod tubes are pretty useless. Yeah. I, have, I have a bucket. I have a bucket in my basement with somehow. Yeah. Somehow, I'm pretty sure you've probably pawned a couple off on me because I have more rod tubes in my basement than I have rods. So I don't know how that happened. Uh, you have any good flies for Andros bonefish? Yes, gotcha. And uh, Enrico Puglisi's spawning shrimp. It's about all I ever use there. Period. End of story size four and maybe some size sixes, but make sure you have them in different weights. Make sure you have some with, with met, heavy me, solid metal eyes, bead chain eyes, and um, no eyes or plastic eyes. And that's, you'll be fine. <laughs> Not that I don't take a lot of different bullfish flies <laughs> with me, but I always end up using the same damn flies. Bonefish are not terribly selective. I wonder, can Orvis site make a wish list so someone can add that on list to save it to buy it later yeah we don't have a wish list on our site yeah there there is a it's coming though yeah i think it's coming and there is a save for later function on the orvis website daniel what is preferred many different flies in your box or many of the same confidence flies um michael that that depends on your philosophy, really. Mm-hmm. People do it both ways. I have many different flies and many confidence flies. I have a lot of flies. <laughs> Sounds like you do too, Seth. Yep. <laughs> Never have too many flies. There's definitely a, a couple of rows in my fly box that seem to disappear faster than others and some flies that have been in there for a long time. But you never know when that one you've never used is going to work. I keep carrying them. Dusty wants to know what's a good collapsible staff. Um, I have an Orvis one. I don't know if we still sell it. That works great. I don't. Uh, I don't use it that often, but there's times when I have. Um, maybe Julia can put up one uh, a link to one of our staffs. But I, I do have a collapsible one that I like. You use a staff ever, Seth? Um, I've never, young. I've never carried one, but I've, I've, I usually find a good stick on the side of the river, yeah. And, yeah, and then try, and then try and leave it where I cross, so that when I need to cross back, I have it again. But I do, yeah. I do the same thing. There, there's a couple rivers where I carry a staff. I don't end up using it much, mm-hmm. but boy, it's just nice to have it just in case. 
Yeah, I, imagine... saw, I saw someone recently using a, a collapsible ski pole. Um, mm-hmm. and that was mm-hmm. that was a pretty good one. Yeah, yeah, they work. I'm trying to read this question here, and I can't see it. I tied some up some root beer, pink, and orange silly leg gotchas in four and six. You will be fine. For Andros, of course, the guy, the guy will look at all your flies. This is this is classic. <laughs> the the bo- no matter how many flies you take on a bowfish trip, the guide will look at all of your flies and then say, "Got anything else?" <laughs> Always. Yep. And and they won't bring any flies, but somehow they'll reach into their yeah, <laughs> and they'll, they'll they'll pull one out and they'll say, "Try this." Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> Do you use fly rod? for fishing a bass fish yes mm-hmm. uh, we do a lot of all of us do a lot of uh, bass fishing largemouth and smallmouth yep. and, and striped bass and salt and striped bass and salt water great fly rod fish all right seth i think we're looks like we're kind of running out of questions Thank you, Julia, for posting the uh, waiting staff, the collapsible waiting staff. Um, yeah, it looks like uh, it looks like we're we're running out of questions. Um, cool, Seth. Thank you for coming on today and sharing your wisdom on on packing it was very enlightening yeah thanks for having me tom this was a lot of fun thanks for sharing your experience and thanks to all of you for um for your great questions and for being here and for hanging out with us for an hour or so um we really appreciate it and um again if you have you know if you have specific travel questions don't hesitate to reach out to seth or any of Seth's other, uh, what are there, four of you? Mm-hmm. Yep. F- four travel specialists. Uh, they're all they're all fly fishers. They're all anglers, experienced anglers. Uh, they've been around the world, and and they know they know these operations, and they can you know tell you from personal experience what the best what the best fit would be for for what you want to do on your next trip and. I know a lot of us are really dying to get traveling again. So you guys are pretty busy, aren't you, Seth? Right yeah, um, it's been incredible. I think people are tired of being cooped up. So um, <laughs> our, our phones have been ringing steadily um, here in 2021. So yeah. um, a lot of a lot of great places to go out there, both domestically and uh, a lot of international destinations are opening up quickly. So if they're not open already. Um, yeah. Yeah, Bahamas is open. Belize is open. Mm-hmm. And I would advise you if you really want to take a trip uh, this year, then I, I'd get on it and, and plan it and book it because um, things are gonna things are going to fill up very quickly this year. Yep. So don't don't put it off. Uh, a lot of us like to sometimes plan our fishing trips last minute, but this is probably not the year <laughs> to do it last minute if you have a particular destination in mind that you want to go to. All right, everyone. Well, thanks again, and um, we'll see you here again soon. We're going to be next Monday. I think the next live we have is next Monday. We're going to be tying the um, the uh, Come At Me Cray, Tim Johnson's Come At Me Cray. So it's crayfish fly. It'd be good for uh, both uh, bass and, uh, and trout and other species, even pike. So um, we'll see you then. And we're going to be doing more of these uh, tackle tackle uh, packing uh, tips for you. We're going to be doing one. I know that people are excited about vest versus sling bag with Jesse Haller. Um, there should be lots of interesting questions there. So anyway, thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll see you soon. Stay healthy.